let's turn in our Bibles to a logical place in our church. Let's turn over to Ephesians chapter 2 is where we will begin this series. And we will be referring to this passage more than once as we go through because it is a foundational truth. Uh, this series, Secure Forever, if you wanted a, uh, a subtitle to this, it would be True Salvation and Its Relationship to the Christian Life. We're not only going to be talking about what salvation is, how to get saved, but we're also going to be talking about once you're saved and, and, and how that all works and how that fits in. And so I'm very glad you're with us as we embark really on this exciting, exciting series uh, going through the Word of God. Let me say this as we begin in way of introduction. The most important issue that any human being will ever face in life is where they will spend eternity. Friends, forever is forever. It's not temporary. And every person is either going to spend eternity with God in heaven or eternity apart from God in hell. Uh, I don't even like to use the word hell, but it's in the Bible and we use it when it is appropriate because it's part of Scripture. Jesus referred to hell more than he actually did to heaven. Most people have a hard time believing that, but that is the truth of it in Scripture. The Bible has proven itself to be true, and according to the Bible, every person will spend forever one of those two places. Now, that's a sobering thought. That's a sobering thought, because that includes you. And you have to decide, and you have to understand the truth of God. And friend, your life continues to go by. It's like a stopwatch, okay? Or it's like, it's like a clock, and the hands are moving, and there's a day coming, and you don't know when it is, and I don't know when my life is going to end either. But you need to put your faith in Jesus Christ as Savior before you die. Because once you die, there's no second chances. You might say, what about purgatory? No such place. No such place. Made up by man. Made up by religion. Okay? It's not in the Bible. Now, <clears throat> forever someplace. With that in mind, the most important day of my life was August 2nd, 1972. That's just over 46 years ago. I, I thought about that this week, and I thought, my, oh my, 46 years. That can't really be true. I mean, I don't think I'm 46 yet, but I am. I have to come to grips with that. No, honestly, 46 years ago, someone cared enough about me. And by the way, this is how we all get saved, isn't it? Pretty much. Someone cared enough about me to invite me out to a meeting where I understood for the first time what Jesus Christ had done for me when he died on the cross. In simple terms, I understood the gospel. The man who was speaking that night, he quoted these verses that we're beginning with as we go through this series. Look at it with me. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9, it says this, For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Well, when I saw those verses, I was kind of shocked by them because I'd never seen anything like that. Being raised in a religion that had taught me that my good works were necessary for me to go to heaven, he captured my attention. And, you know, I was raised in a religion. I was raised Roman Catholic, and we had respect for the Word of God. We were taught that the Bible was the Word of God, and yet I was taught that my good works had a part in saving me. And so here I had this conflict going back and forth, back and forth. Well, it, it says it's not of works, but you've been taught differently all your life. Yeah, but it's in the Bible. Yeah, but, you know, 19 years of training. Yeah, but it's in the Bible. Who are you going to believe? You're going to believe God? You're going to believe man? Man can make mistakes. God can't make mistakes. Okay? He then explained what Jesus Christ had done for me. Now, <clears throat> I use this illustration not because I don't know anything else to do, but because, friends, this gets people to understand it. And I saw this, and I understood the gospel through it. So could I share it with you today? We're going to let this hand represent you and me. 
We're going to let my wallet represent our sin. One of our men was sharing with me uh, this week who worked the fair. He was saying how that the hand gesture made it so clear to somebody. They saw it and they trusted Christ as their Savior. This is what we call a hand gesture, the wallet illustration. This hand, you and me, my wallet, our sin. God loves us, but he hates our sin. Okay? Now, God says because we've sinned, our sin has to be paid for. He is a just God. We have violated his laws. Okay? There's a penalty for that. And he says that the wages of sin is death. Okay? Good works do not pay for sin. Now, heaven is a perfect place. So if I am a sinner and heaven's a perfect place, no sin in heaven, but I am a sinner. What does that tell me? It tells me I'm already disqualified. It tells me I'm in a predicament. It tells me I need a payment for sin. And if I do it, I would spend forever separated from God if I had to do it. Now, again, I was taught that my good works would take care of that issue. But nowhere in the Bible does it say good works pay for sin. As a matter of fact, we're not saved by good works as we've just seen. We're saved by grace, God's unmerited favor, his undeserved kindness to us. We're saved by grace through faith. Faith in what? In Jesus Christ and what he did on the cross. What did he do for us on the cross? Well, look up here. Because there's nothing we could do to save ourselves, God himself took on flesh, this hand representing the Lord Jesus Christ. And because there's nothing we could do to save ourselves, and yet God wanting us to live with him forever in heaven, God in the flesh, the Lord Jesus Christ, came and he took our sin upon himself when he died on the cross. He died and he made the complete payment for our sin when he died on the cross. He was buried, and he came back from the dead three days later. And he says in his word that if we will put our faith in him, that he did that, that he made that payment for us, the moment we do, he saves us from hell to heaven, gives us everlasting life. We become his child simply by faith in Christ. You might say, what about works? Well, look at verse 9. It says it's not of works. See, God has simple answers. It's up, it, man's the problem. Man has a hard time accepting what God says. But God has simple answers. Jesus has paid for all your sin, dear friend. Will you trust in him that he did that for you? Now, if you don't trust in him that he did that for you, that payment he made for you is not good on your behalf. In other words, you don't get the benefits from that. You'll be lost forever. But when you trust in Christ that he made that payment for you, you are forgiven of all your sin. He gives you everlasting life. Not only that, but the Bible said you can know that you have eternal life. Well, you know what? When I saw these verses and when I understood it, especially when I saw Ephesians 2, 8, 9, it was like time stood still for me. I mean, I remember it like it was yesterday. I just stood there staring. What are you going to do with this? What are you going to do with this? Let me ask you this morning. What are you going to do with this? He said, I needed to trust in Jesus Christ as my personal Savior. And you know what? I did. And the moment I trusted in Christ, according to the Bible, I was saved forever by the grace of God. From that moment on, I knew, based on what the Bible said that I had everlasting life, that I would go to heaven when I died. How? Simply by faith alone in Christ alone. Okay? Nothing more, nothing less, nothing else. Now, hopefully that's clear to you because that is the only way anybody ever gets saved. And he said, and I remember that night, because, you know, raised in a religion, any religion that says you can't know for sure you're going to heaven is based on works for salvation. Even those who say they believe it's by grace alone through faith alone, if they say you can't know you have eternal life, their faith somewhere in there is based on works. There's some extent of works involved in what they believe. You might say, why do you say that? Well, because the Bible says you can know, and it's based on whether you've trusted Jesus Christ as Savior or not. Look at it with me, 1 John chapter 5. 
1 John chapter 5, in verse 13. Now, I remember seeing this, and I was so thrilled because I understood. Well, you know what? I can know I'm going to heaven because the Bible says so. And the reason I can know I'm going to heaven, not only does God say so in his word, but it makes total sense that if going to heaven is all based on what Jesus did for me and not what I do for him, then I could be sure because what he did was complete. Okay? He can't fail. I can fail, but he can't fail. And it says in 1 John 5, 13, These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God, the Son of God. Okay, Jesus, the Christ, okay, Jesus Christ. Christ was not his last name. Christ means the anointed one, the Messiah. Jesus, though, means God our Savior. And so when I believed on him that he is God who paid for my sins, who will save me. When I put my faith in him, guess what? He did. He saved me. And it says, These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God, that ye may know that you have eternal life. 95% of the people you meet do not know they have eternal life. Okay? And the reason is, is they think it's up to them, living a faithful life, enduring to the end, persevering to the end, uh, uh, cleaning up their life, etc., etc., etc. Well, you know what? When I trusted Christ as Savior, it was the most exciting day of my life without knowing what it would entail. After that meeting that night, we went to McDonald's and sitting outside eating. I don't remember what I had, probably a Big Mac back then. I said, you know what, I don't understand it all, but what that man is talking about tonight, that's what I want to do with the rest of my life. I didn't understand it. Did I have to do that? No. Was it part of God saving me? No. No. God saved me simply by what Christ did on the cross, not by my desire to go on for him. Now, it's been over 46 years now, and the good news for me, the gospel is just as fresh today as the night I trusted Christ. I mean that with all my heart. I never get tired of sharing the gospel. The message I believe that night is the exact same message that I believe today and preach today. That hasn't changed one iota. It's the truth. It will never change. However, what has changed is my greater understanding of the many ways Satan and even man attacks this message of salvation by grace. Folks, they're getting more and more clever all the time, but it's the same poison. It's the same poison. Some of the ways Satan works are obvious, yet others can be very subtle. Understand this. If eternal life in heaven comes only through the message of the gospel, which means good news, then any other message will give a person a false hope of where they're going to spend eternity, okay? And the truth of it is that false hope will not lead them to heaven. It will only lead them to hell. Paul said this in 2 Corinthians chapter 11. He said, but I, verse 3, he says, But I fear lest by any means as the serpent, the devil, beguiled Eve through his subtlety. That word means craftiness, cleverness. See, that's how he works. He's clever. So even so, uh, or excuse me, so your mind should be corrupted through the simplicity that is in Christ. Do you see that? Through the simplicity that is in Christ. The gospel message is a simple message, okay? You might say, well, what about uh, what we need to do, our works, and this and that? No, that has no part in saving you. What saves us is what Christ did for us, not what we do for him. Now, as we go through this series, understand this. This series is going to focus on two main issues issues. And the first one is this. What is, what's in, and by the way, pay careful attention to these words. The first one is the preservation of the saints. The preservation of the saints. In other words, true salvation and how it relates 
to the Christian life. In other words, God preserves the believer for all eternity. God keeps us saved for all eternity. In other words, we can never be lost once we have put our trust in Jesus Christ as Savior. Now, is there a life to live once we've trusted Christ? Yes, God has a desire for us, but it's not a requirement, but it is a desire. We will get to that in detail in this series. But secondly, first issue, the preservation of the saints. Secondly, the perversion of the truth in what is called the perseverance of the saints. Now, the preservation of the saints is our eternal security. God preserves us and keeps us safe forever. Yet there is something that's come along that wants to say, well, it's the same thing. I've had people tell me, well, the perseverance of the saints is the same thing as eternal security. No, it is not. No, it is not. The, the, pre- the perseverance of the saints is the fifth point of Calvinism. And it teaches that you have to endure to the end of your life being faithful to Christ if you want to make it to heaven. It is nothing less than works for salvation. Now, I know there are some people who will hear this over the radio and internet and so forth, and they may get upset at that. Friend, I just want you to be patient as we go through because I will quote to you from famous Calvinistic authors and theologians, the very thing I just said, that it's based on you persevering to the end of your life. Well, listen, I'm getting ahead of myself, but let me tell you this, that is works for salvation. Anybody who thinks they have to stay faithful to Christ to get to heaven is trusting in their own faithfulness and merit to get there. You have not rested in the finished work of Jesus Christ, okay? I will define and explain more in detail later, but it is basically saying that you must be faithful to Christ until you die. Unfortunately, there are many, many, many people who, are, who not only believe that today, but are teaching that to the detriment of people being truly secure in Christ. Listen, if you believe you have to be faithful to the end in order to be sure you're going to heaven, you cannot know you have eternal life now. Be honest. Be honest. Anybody who thinks they have to endure to the end cannot know they have eternal life now. Now, some of the Calvinists and some who who believe in the perseverance of the saints will say, well, yeah, you're right. They get it. Well, at least they're honest about it. The fact is this. If you have to endure to the end, then who are you trusting in? You're trusting in yourself. If you have to endure to the end, you're trusting in yourself. However, if Jesus, if, if my eternal life is in his hands and is secure in his hands, then I can know I'm going to heaven because he can't fail, yet I can. This is the beauty of the gospel. This is what makes it good news. It's not good news that if I end up failing or falling away, I'm not saved. It is good news that Jesus Christ keeps me saved no matter what. Now, there are still people who say, well, isn't that the same? No, they're not the same. They're diametrically opposed, as we will see as we go through. So, number two, what is the problem at hand? Well, I've already touched on it some, but before we get to the problem, let me introduce it by saying this, okay? One of the great characteristics of the Bible and the words of Jesus is the simplicity and yet the depth of the statements that we find in Scripture. Jesus spoke, now get this, folks, Jesus spoke in terms that children could understand, Yet those same terms are so deep that theologians will never exhaust them. That's one of the marks of inspiration right there. Kids could get it. As a matter of fact, 
Who was the one who said, you must become like a little child if you're going to enter the kingdom? It was Jesus. You know what kids, what is he referring to? Simple faith. Just like children, they believe it. Okay, there's a, you could tell children just about anything and they'll believe it, especially if you're a parent or someone they trust. They'll believe it. That's childlike faith. God says we need to have childlike faith if we're going to make it to heaven. You need to trust in Christ as your Savior. Now, with this in mind, the greatest of all issues for us to understand is this issue of salvation. It is simple to grasp and enter into, yet, it is, yet the depth of it is inexhaustible. Now, Paul under inspiration. I want you to see this. Turn with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 9. 2 Corinthians chapter 9. He understood this, this champion of grace, the Apostle Paul. He understood this, and he had something to say that I think is incredibly significant. In 2 Corinthians 9, 15, referring to our great salvation, Paul says this. He says, Thanks be unto God for his unspeakable gift. His unspeakable gift. Now, the word unspeakable means incapable of being adequately expressed or uttered. Unspeakable, inexpressible is the idea. Unutterable, ineffable, okay? You can't, you can't, or in, in, ineffable, excuse me. You can't describe it effectively because it is so awesome, words cannot describe it. Now, I think most of you know that words can only go so far, right? I mean, they, they, they only go so far. Now, I'm glad for words because we understand by them, but the depth of what those words represent, they fall short. We can never find the words to completely describe the greatness of God's salvation. We cannot find words to describe the greatest gift of all, which is biblical salvation. Jesus made the terms of how to be saved very clear when he said in John 6, 47. Okay, you can turn there. You can look at it on the screen with me. John 6, 47. Now look at what Jesus said. Now, listen before we read it. He was either telling the truth or he wasn't. Now this starts in on this issue. This is where this can get hot. He was either telling the truth or he wasn't. Jesus is God who cannot lie. So therefore, folks, was he telling the truth? Yes, he was. He said in John 6, 47, verily, verily, and by the way, that means truly, truly, I say unto you, he that believeth on me hath, that means has right now, present tense, everlasting life. Now, what is it that we are believing in him for? That he is God in the flesh who went to the cross and paid for our sins and then rose from the grave. Now, yes, when he said this, he had not yet gone to the cross. Okay? But God lives in eternity, right? Everybody knew who he claimed to be, the Messiah. And those who knew the Old Testament knew that the Messiah would be a suffering Messiah, Isaiah 53. So there's a context of what Jesus is talking about here. And if we would believe or trust in him as our Savior, we would have, the moment we trusted in him, everlasting life. Now, is that true or is it not true? It's true. How long is everlasting? It is forever. Okay? John 3.16, same thing. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. The context is incredibly clear. Jesus is talking to Nicodemus using the illustration from the book of Numbers that as the serpent was lifted up in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have eternal life. Nicodemus knew the story. And from Numbers, all they had to do, remember when they were bitten by serpents? All they had to do 
was look and live. They would look and they would live. They would look by faith to the serpent on the pole. And instead of dying, they would live. No promise of commitment. No follow-up. Simple faith. That's exactly what Jesus is getting at in John 3, verse 16. This one condition was proclaimed not only through the lips of Jesus, the Son of God, who can't lie, who cannot make a mistake, but also under inspiration, okay, we find it in the Scriptures, that's what I'm talking about, we see it coming from the lips of John the Baptist, John the Apostle, James, Peter, Paul and countless others down through the ages who were faithful with this great message of faith alone in Christ alone. Jesus also went on to say that he would never lose us once we have come to him by faith. We have everlasting life. And it, folks, it is just that simple, yet so deep. Look at John chapter 3, or excuse me, John chapter 6, a little further. John chapter 6. And I want you to see in John chapter 6, verse 37, Jesus says this. He says, All that the Father giveth me shall come to me, and him that cometh to me I will in no wise, no way, cast out. Okay? Now look at that. Look at that. If you come to him to be saved, if you come to him by faith, if you put your faith in him, he promises he will in no way cast you out. Now, is that not eternal security? Yes. Can you know you're going to heaven because you believe what he says? Yes. You, see, if you take God at his word, you can know. Verse 38, for I came down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him that sent me. Now, the Son of God who sent him, the Father sent him. The Father sent the Son to be the Savior of the world. 1 John 4. Jesus was a perfectly obedient Son. He could be nothing less. He couldn't be disobedient because that would be sin. So he came down to do the will of the Father who sent him. So was he going to perfectly accomplish the will of the Father? Yes. Why? Because he's the perfect Son. Now keep that in mind as you look at verse 39. And this is the will of the Father which hath sent me, that of all which he hath given me, I should lose nothing, but should raise it up again at the last day. Lose nothing. Hey, guess what? We're at least something. He said he wouldn't lose us. We come by faith. He won't cast us out. Okay, He won't lose us. He'll keep us because he came to do the will of the Father and the will of the Father is that all who come to Christ are kept secure in Christ by the work of Christ, not by our work. See, believers are secure forever in him. This is truly eternal security, and it is all in Christ. By the way, eternal security is not a separate doctrine from salvation. If you are not saved forever, you are not saved at all. This wonderful reality changes lives and excites people both here and now and on into eternity. It is such awesome news. It's so powerful. It is so pure. It is so simple. I love the gospel. Do you love the gospel? I love the gospel. Often, the first response of a new believer to his personal salvation is to share this good news with those closest to him. Now, that's not a, a law or a rule, but often that is the case, okay? The woman at the well, come see a man who told me all things ever I did. Is not this the Christ, right? It's the first thing she did. The night I trusted Christ as Savior, I couldn't wait to get home. I went home, I walked in the door. Man, I didn't know what was in store for me. I walked in the door and from the front door, as soon as I walked in, I said, Mom, Pop, guess what? I'm going to heaven when I die, or I know I'm going to heaven when I die. 
It's the first thing I said. Was I a theologian? No, but I had it right. My mom said, you can't know that. Well, yeah, you can. It's right in the Bible. It's right in the Bible. I did my best to find it. I had a hard time, but I did my best to find it. Newborn babe. Well, nothing was going to deter me. That night I went to bed, and I laid in bed, and I shared my bedroom with my brother, or I shared the bedroom with my brother Larry, and I laid there, and listen, folks, I'm not into feelings, but I had feelings that night. I was so excited. I was floating. It was like I was on cloud nine. Why do we always choose number nine? You ever know? I just thought about that. Why not cloud seven? Isn't that the number of perfection? Anyway, I'm laying there waiting for him to come home. Why? Because I love my brother and I want him to be saved. What, what made me like this? The grace of God and being saved by the grace of God and having forgiveness of my sins. So this is common, not a rule, but it's common for people who just newly get saved. What do they want to do? They're so excited about their salvation. Man, they want to tell everybody about it. The next day I went to art college. That's where I was at the time. And I, and I went to art college and I plotted on how I could get my best friend at art college alone to where I could talk to him about this and tell him about it. But you see, here's what happens. And it didn't happen to me. And I thank God every day that it didn't. But what often happens is that this new believer starts attending a church, because if you're saved, you should go to a good Bible-believing church, but a new believer doesn't know what is a good church and what isn't. So this new believer starts attending a church or a Bible study, innocent in the faith and seeking truth, and in that church or Bible study, he is often introduced to false teaching, which clouds the issue for him. See, when he got saved, it was easy. He got it. I'm saved. I'm saved forever. I'm eternally secure in Christ. It's not of works. No matter what I do, I can't be lost. No matter what I do, oh, I'm so excited. I want to tell the world of the love of Christ. And yet he starts going to a Bible study. And not all Bible studies are bad. Or church, and certainly not all churches are bad. But he's introduced to false teaching. And you see what happens is this, folks. What is pure and simple starts getting more and more complicated and confusing through teachers and preachers who themselves have never actually been saved. Or if they were saved, they got off track and they started reading books instead of the book, the Word of God. And they start saying things that are not true. And the assurance of salvation can begin to be undermined as the new believer, now listen carefully, starts hearing things such as this. These are real things that are being said. All of them I've heard myself or something very similar to it. Here you go. They hear things like this. Well, if you're really saved... You will hate the things you once loved and love the things you once hated. Well, you know, that would be nice, but it doesn't always work that way. And a person who's saved, they hear that and they say, well, you know what, I still have a desire for this wrong thing in my life. And if what the preacher's saying or the teacher at the Bible study is saying, I must not be saved. So all of a sudden, instead of rejoicing in their salvation, they start questioning their salvation. Here's another one. If you haven't forsaken all your sin, you were never really saved to begin with. You had a head belief, not a heart belief. Well, let me ask you, have you forsaken all of your sin? I said, well, yeah, yeah, I have. Oh, really? Do you still sin? Well, yeah. Well, then you haven't forsaken all your sin. If you haven't repented of all your sin, twisting the meaning of repentance, by the way, if you haven't repented of all your sin, you are not saved yet. You have to really, quote-unquote, mean business with God 
and repent of all your sin. Have you repented of all your sin? Preacher, have you repented of all your sin? Teacher, have you repented of all your sin? Whatever that means. By the way, that term is never in the Bible in reference to getting to heaven. Did you know that? Nowhere does it say that. You have to repent of all your sin to go to heaven. Here's another one. If you are still desiring the things of the world, you are probably not saved. Okay? The things of the world. I don't know. Does that include a new car? Does that include a better house? Does that include nicer clothes? Does that include season tickets to the twins? Well, I don't know if I'd want those right now, but anyways. um, Where do we get this? Not in the Bible. Here's another one. You can't go to heaven if you are hanging on to the world. Boy, that covers a lot of ground there. So if there's, is there anything in the world that's appealing to you? Well, then you better check it out whether you're saved or not, according to them. Here's another one. Oh, they love this one. Makes no sense whatsoever. It's so false doctrinally. If Christ is not Lord of all, he's not Lord at all. Any of you ever heard that one? Okay. Yeah, lots of you have. Hey, I got news for you. He is Lord Whether you allow him to be Lord in your life or not, he is Lord. He is Lord all the time, okay? It's not biblical. Here's here's this one. I heard this one. Famous Pentecostal preacher in San Antonio, Texas said this. If you come to church with a sour or negative disposition, don't fool yourself into thinking you're going to heaven. If you are practicing, here's another one, if you're practicing certain sins, you're not saved. They, they, by the way, they're the ones who make up the list, of course. Here's another one. If you've grown tor- cold towards the Lord, you were probably never truly saved to begin with. And that's a favorite of Calvinists. Here's another one. If you are not tithing, you will not go to heaven. Most Christians don't tithe, I can tell you that. Give 10% of their income. If you're not tithing, you won't go to heaven. You might say, how is, you know, how is that related? Okay, well, let me tell you how that happened. By the way, that, that was said by a famous Presbyterian who is now dead. And uh, <clears throat> he was speaking from... Uh, Malachi. And Malachi says to the Jewish people, he says, you know, uh, you're robbing me by not tithing to me. That's what he says. Well, then he links that to 1 Corinthians 6 out of context, which says no thieves will enter the kingdom. So then he puts two and two together and he comes up with an erroneous answer. No, it's not true. If you don't, here you go, if you don't endure and persevere as a Christian to the end of your life, you were never really, or you were never a real Christian to begin with. All true Christians endure to the end. Huh, you know what there's a problem with that? I can show you verse after verse that says just the opposite. Now, listen carefully. It should be emphasized at this point that when we trust Christ as Savior, we do receive a new nature, And with that, the power to overcome sin. And with that, the power to live victoriously for the Lord, although we'll never be perfect by it, but God does enable us. And we certainly should live for Christ once we're saved, but that is not a requirement to getting to heaven. Ephesians 2.10 says, We are His workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto, not by, unto, for, or for the purpose of good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. But you notice the words are important. It doesn't say that we will walk in them. It doesn't say that we must walk in them. It says we should walk in them. Should is the only word that would go with salvation by grace. The only one. Because grace is unmerited, undeserved. It's not based on our merit, our works. It's based on what God has done for us. 
But you see the fact that we should live for Christ once we're saved? Is, is there a guarantee that we will live a victorious life and be faithful to the end? The answer to that is no. If we were to honestly think about the statements, folks, now listen, if we were to honestly think about the statements that I have just read that people are saying today, all of us would have to doubt whether we're saved or not. All of us. Why? Because we all fail at one time or another. And then you, I can hear them. Well, yeah, we all fail, but how much do we fail? <laughs> Listen, you either fail or you don't. If you, have to, if you have to live up to a certain requirement with your life, you're going to fall short of it. That's why Jesus came, because we couldn't earn our salvation, friend. That's why he came. They're the same ones who say, well, uh, yeah, you can sin, but you can't practice sin. I heard a famous evangelist say that. He said, I sin, but I don't practice sin. I thought, sure you do. Every time you get up, you're preaching a false gospel. That's a sin, and you're practicing it. This series probably won't make me any friends. <laughs> but I have to be true to the scriptures. See, we all fail one time or another. We would never, ever be able to have the assurance of salvation if we're basing our salvation on the things I just read you instead of the promise of God. Now, listen carefully. What I have just shared with you, I call it the theological elephant in the room. It's the elephant in the room if you say there is an elephant in the room, you mean that there is an obvious problem or difficult situation that people do not want to talk about or face up to. Even though everyone knows it's there, even though everyone knows it's a problem and it's a contradiction, no one wants to talk about it. That's an elephant in the room. Well, guess what? I am addressing the elephant in the room in this series. And that elephant is ugly. Now, in view of the statements that I have just read, several questions must be asked. First is this. Are the statements of these teachers biblical? That's a fair question, isn't it? Isn't that what we're supposed to do? Not judge by our opinion, but judge by the Bible? Can we do that? We need to do that, don't we? We need to do that. So, are the statements of these teachers biblical? Secondly, does God want us to live our lives in uncertainty and doubt, questioning whether we are his children or not? Is that the way he wants us to live? I can tell you this way, you will not live successfully for Jesus Christ if that's what you think. Third, how much failure, if any, can there be and still have the assurance of salvation? Or, to put it another way, how faithful do we need to be to be sure of heaven? Both of them smack of self-righteousness. Fourth, what if we don't endure to the end but die in a backslidden condition? Will we end up in hell? It's a serious question. Folks, this is not, people, uh, there will be people who hear this say, oh, you're just trying to divide and sp split theological hairs. No, friend, no, friend. I am concerned about the destiny of human beings. And listen, this is a real issue. And if you don't get this straight, you are going to be a theological mess your whole life. And you will not have the joy of your salvation that God wants you to have. You actually may become psychotic you may end up in a mental institution if you don't get this right. And I say, oh, you're dramatizing it. N dramatizing it. No, I'm not. I had a friend uh, who uh, was a, a, a psychology major, and he had summer residence here in, at the VA. 
okay? And a lot of the people he dealt with at the VA were in the psych ward at the VA because of religious delusions. And a lot of those religious delusions had to do with the fear of death because of the choices they made in life and the things they believe that their religion had taught them. Wow, what a contrast that is to when Jesus said, you should know the truth and the truth will make you free. Here's another one. Is salvation a gift or not? Yes or no? Is salvation a gift or not? Those of you who worked the survey, you know the humor in this one, the sad humor in this. You'll go through the survey. Is salvation a gift or is it something you can earn? And some people will say, well, it's a gift, but it's a gift that needs to be earned. It's dead serious. Friend, if you have to earn a gift, it's no longer a gift. Gifts are free. Bought and paid for by someone else. That's what our salvation is. The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Is salvation a gift or not? By the way, that can only be yes or no. Not, well, kind of, maybe. And last, does man have the ability to choose anything for himself? Does he have the ability to choose before he believes, but not after he believes? Now, these are serious problems. These things, these questions have to be addressed, and that's what this series is about. In reality, here you go. In reality, if what many preachers are saying is true, then honestly, no one will be saved in the end. No one. We all still sin. We all fail. We all practice sin. Okay? We all love the world at times in our lives. We all do things we know we shouldn't do. If what they are saying is not true, and it's not, then where do this, these false ideas come from? Where'd they come from? Now, the obvious one is from the devil. I get that. But where did they come from? We're going to look at that. Let's close over in 1 John chapter 5, back where we began, 1 John 5 and verse 13. How much better to believe what God says? It's always the case, by the way. <clears throat> Religion messes everything up. Christianity frees us into the peace and love of Christ. 1 John 5, 13, These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God. Those of you who believe on the name of the Son of God, look what it says, that you may know that you have eternal life. Know that you have eternal life. Let me ask you this today. Have you believed, have you put your faith in Jesus Christ alone as your Savior? If you have, God is writing this to you, and he says you can know that you have eternal life. I like written guarantees. I like everything in writing. Well, God gives it to us in writing. He says, if you've trusted in my Son as your Savior you can know that you have eternal life. Do you know it? I hope you do. Well, friends, that concludes this edition of Voice of Assurance. Thanks so much for listening. And would you share this ministry with a friend? To contact us or learn more about our ministry, please visit www.northlandchurch.com. Your prayers and support for this ministry are greatly appreciated. Thank you so much, and God bless you.